This is the eighth in a series of lectures on algebra for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we'll take a deeper look at fields. Let's think about um, how to reduce some notation for the various sets that we've been talking about over and over again. It's traditional to write a Z with a double bar through it for the set of all set of all integers. So Z is not an integer, it's the collection of all integers, all put together, not a book but a library. Um, similarly, Q with a, with a bar through it is the set of all rational numbers. And R is the set of all real numbers. And C, again with a little bar through it, is the set of all complex numbers. Um, if I take a number m and I multiply it by all the integers, the collection of, pr of multiples, integer multiples of m, um, is, uh, is, the, is the notation we'll use here. m times z means the set of all, of all uh, integer multiples of an integer m, or, well, some m, some number m, which for us will always be an integer. And then um, if we quotient those out, it's z mod mz is our notation for the set of all, the set of all uh, remainders mod uh, a given integer m, where we we'll assume here m is going to be, um, in this case, we'll just assume that m is going to be a, a positive integer. We can try and draw some sort of pictures of these we're familiar with. Uh, the real number line, and with inside the real number line, if you go every one unit along, starting at some zero, you have one, two, minus one, and so on. So the integers, and uh, similarly, you can try and draw the, the complex numbers as the complex plane. These pictures are only uh, somewhat helpful in trying to get a sense of what uh, what these things look like. Uh, the addition operation can be sort of geometrically described, and the multiplication is mm, maybe not quite so geometric. Um, uh, if we wanted to think about the the integers modulo uh, modulo a prime, we could or modulo a, an integer, we could consider one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, we need to go to yeah, let's go to zero. Let's put that zero, zero there. Um, so that uh, so we get this is the integers mod mod six. Okay, so this will be z mod six z for example as a kind of picture, and it's useful to think of it as something like a ring because every time you add one, you move around. So if you add two, you just move twice. Three plus two is five. Um, four plus two is zero, and so on. So at least the addition law is reasonably well captured by the picture, but the multiplication is not, not so easy to describe in that simple way, geometrically. There's a great similarity between all these different types of objects we've been thinking about, um, the integers, the, the rational numbers, the complex numbers, and so on. Each of them is, is an object uh, which has addition and, 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 and multiplication. Um, so uh, we want to have a general definition of such a thing. A ring is a set S, which uh, which is equipped with two uh, two operations, which we'll call addition and multiplication. They could really be just any old things, any old operations at all, uh, but we'll always refer to them as addition and multiplication. And we'll of course denote them with a plus sign and with a time sign, or just by writing things next to each other, as we've been doing, so that if um, B and C are um, are in uh, the ring S, then uh, B plus C and B times C are also in that ring S. And uh, we have a whole bunch of laws. It's going to be a, a nice long list of laws, which, which are maybe a bit hard to remember, all of them. Um, if you add any two of them and then add another one on, it's the same as if you did it in this other order, um, the the um, the um, associative law for addition, and then um, we want a zero. There is an element. Oh, and I should say this is for any any a, b, and c in the ring. I'll, I won't write it all out, but this is if a, b, and c are any elements of our ring, 
Um, uh, we also want to say there is an element zero in our ring. I won't write that it's in the ring. Everything's in the ring here, S. Um, so that for any element, let's say B, zero plus B um, is, sorry, I, want, I guess I, well, that doesn't really matter. Zero plus B is, is B. Uh, so that's going to be our, our zero. And it's got to be for any element in the ring, any element B in the ring. Uh, the next uh, law is that um, for any uh, B and C in the ring, um, again, everything is in the ring. These are all supposed to be in the ring. This is in the ring, in the ring. Um, uh, then um, there is a... Uh, sorry, the <laughs> what do I want to say? Um, let's see, A plus B is in the ring. And the, oh, there is, uh, for any B in the ring, um, there is some C in the ring with um, B plus C equal to that zero that we just talked about here. And um, our next rule is going to be that when we add, we can always add in any order. Again, that's for any elements of the ring. Um, and um, the next law is associativity for multiplication. A, B, C equals A, B, C for any elements of the ring. Um, and um, finally, we need the distributive laws B plus C, A is B, A plus C, A. And um, A, B plus C is A, B plus A, C again for any elements of the ring. So why am I writing out all these laws? I'm saying that uh, we've encountered various various things like the integers, the rational numbers, the real numbers, and so on, all of which satisfy all of these laws for their addition and multiplication operations. And things that have such, that have laws that satisfy all these properties, that satisfy all these laws, and things that have an uh, addition and multiplication satisfying all these laws are called rings, and they come up a lot. We'll find lots and lots of different ones that become basic objects of our, of, of our theory. So as examples of rings, um, we have lots and lots and lots of examples. We already know that um, the integers um, are a ring, and the rational numbers are a ring, and the real numbers are a ring, and the complex numbers are a ring. So it's not that the, that the integers are a bunch of rings. There's a sing That's one single ring. It's a collection of, of objects, the integers. And when we add integers, we get integers. We multiply integers, we get integers. And we satisfy all those rules. Um, Another example is that if x is any set and s is any ring, then the set of all um, of all functions, set of all functions from x to s, is also a ring. How is it a ring? Well, you add by adding functions. You add functions by adding their values, and you multiply by multiplying functions. You multiply functions by multiplying their values. For example, the set of real functions of a real variable is, is a ring, because you can add real functions of a real variable, and you can multiply them, and they satisfy all those rules we wrote down. So another example is that um, if we have s, a ring, and x is an abstract variable, and much like we've talked about before, that we have to make sure that our variables are thought of not as being varying over some portion of the real number line or something like that, or some set, but we think of them just as, as abstract uh, um, expressions that we write down. We write down some variable x, we can write down x squared, x cubed, and so on. We can write down formal sums of those sorts of expressions. And so the set of all polynomials in x with coefficients from S. The set of all of those polynomials is a single, is a ring. One ring consisting of all of those polynomials all put together into one big set. And we know how to add polynomials to get polynomials. We know how to multiply them to get polynomials. So we can add and multiply, and they're here, and they satisfy all the rules that, that we wrote down. It's traditional to call this thing by a funny name. Um, S is the ring itself, which might be, say, the integers or the complex numbers. And then we write S of X with square brackets to mean the collection of all polynomials. So for, ex uh, for example, we could have something like 1 half minus 2x plus 4x squared um, is an element is an element in the rational numbers with an x, with a symbol x adjoined to become pol it's a polynomial in there. Um, we could also allow two variable polynomials. I'll just write that it's 
called s of x, y, and so on, if we want more uh, more um, variables. So we don't really have to explain much about that, well, what that looks like, but things like x squared y plus 7 um, minus y is an object that lives in, um, is in, let's say, q of x, y, for example. We can allow um, stranger objects, stranger kinds of polynomials, and we've already done so. We've already looked at polynomials that are of, of some with some unusual coefficients. So if we, for example, take z mod 15z, that's remainders mod 15, so that's numbers 0 to 14, but with remainder arithmetic, where you add and then take remainder, you multiply and then take remainder to do the adding and multiplying. We can then put in an x, and it's understood that that is supposed to be this whole ring, and then with the x put on the end, um, we could put parentheses if we really wanted to, to make sure that that's the ring and that the x is added to that. Um, that's polynomials with coefficients from um, in, from remainders mod 15. So things like 2, let's put a little bar to, remember that, to remind us that it's a remainder, times x plus 1 with a little bar, to, so that we remember it's a remainder mod, again, mod 15, um, plus 4x to the ninth, y to the seventh, plus... Um, Oh, sorry, I've got, I've got x's and y's. Let's put x's, y's, z's, just to make sure I've got enough variables. Um, plus z to the 1,000. Remember that when you talk about polynomials with remainder coefficients, it's only the coefficients that are remainders. These aren't remainders. These uh, these exponents are not remainders. Um, so that 7 or that 1,000, for example, that 1,000 is not going to get reduced by 15s because it's not a coefficient, it's an exponent. We've also already talked about rational functions to say ratios of polynomials. So if we take um, S, any ring, um, we can try to define, we may not succeed, but we can try to define rational functions. A rational function um, is a ratio of polynomials. But ju that just means for us that we just write down a polynomial numerator and a polynomial denominator. But we say that that's equivalent to um, any non-zero polynomial times this and any non-zero polynomial times that. Um, okay, and again, of course, c of x should be not zero, not the zero polynomial. And a of x should be the not the zero polynomial. So those will be considered the same expression. There is a problem here, though. There's There's a danger that can arise... Um, um, what if somehow a of x times c of x turns out to be zero, the zero polynomial? That we have to somehow avoid, and that's bad. Um, and also we have to worry about um, another, so that's that's one danger, and, and maybe I should just say this will never happen in our examples. Um, so we won't worry about how to avoid that danger. Well, let's just say it never happens in any of our examples, because we're always interested in situations where the polynomials have coefficients that make sure that the only way they could become zero in the product is to have one of those factors be zero. So that won't ever arise as danger, but it is in principle a problem for certain rings. If you take a ring, you try to construct rational functions, you may run into trouble. Again, we'll never run into trouble, so we won't worry about this problem at all. There's another problem that we've already seen, um, which is uh, another problem with, with these things, which is that we might have a rational function, um, let's say for an example, um, so maybe I should say we're ignoring ignoring this danger because it's never going to happen in our example, so we won't worry about that. But what if we were to worry about a different problem? Um, let's work with remainders mod 2, and then we'll work with a rational function uh, in them. So, um, so our rational function will be something like 1 over x um, plus 1 times x. There's a ra perfectly nice rational function. But we, we've we noted before that when you plug in 0, it wipes out. And we uh, this wipes out here. And then when you plug in 1, this wipes out here. So this is not defined as a function uh, for any value of x. And that sounds very bad, a function that's nowhere defined. But that's why we, we really shouldn't call it a function. So so it's really, a, in effect, of a bad name. 
the name rational function that makes us think that it's actually a function. It's a traditional name, so we will stick with it. We'll continue to call these things rational functions. But function isn't the right word, really. It's really just a formal expression which we write down, which has a polynomial in the numerator and polynomial in the denominator. And we manipulate it using the usual rules of fractions. We'll add in the usual manner for fractions and multiply in the usual manner for fractions. I didn't even write that down. But, um, but it is possible that we'll end up with expressions which are meaningless as functions. Um, so previously we found that that this polynomial vanished for, let's see, this polynomial vanished for every um, input. And so as a function, it was the zero function, but it's not the zero polynomial. In much the same way, this is not the zero rational, or not the undefined rational function. This rational function is defined for us. It's just not defined when you plug in any values for x. But when we treat x as an abstract variable, what's perfectly fine, we can manipulate this symbol. So this is OK. It looks dangerous, but it's not really dangerous. It's OK, and we'll allow these things. We don't ever want to allow these kind of nasty behaviors. We've said before that'll never happen in our examples, so we'll just ignore it. But, um, but this we, we actually will allow, because it isn't really dangerous. It only looks dangerous. Again, it isn't really dangerous because, in fact, this isn't really thought of for us as a function, but just as a formal expression. And then it's OK. And uh, the notation that we'll use, much like we had notation for the polynomials, is s with round brackets x is the set of set of all rational functions in a variable x with coefficients from uh, some ring s. Similarly, we'll write things like s of x and y if they if it's a rational function of two variables x and y. Again, they're abstract variables. They're not thought of as as uh, as taking on any values. They're just abstract symbols we write with. Another example, which is only slightly different from the rational function example, um, if you consider uh, again s a ring, any ring. Um, then uh, we can define a new ring, which is s of x and x inverse. And what does that mean? That means it's the set of uh, expressions b of x plus c of x inverse, where these are um, polynomials, the set of all choices of such, a polynomial b in a, in, a, in a variable called x and a polynomial c in a variable called x inverse. Um, with the understanding that we always, uh, we think of x inverse as just a, as just a variable, it's just another variable besides x. But uh, we always, whenever we hit an x with an x inverse or an x inverse with an x, we always let them vaporize each other and replace the result with a 1. So we know how to calculate multiplications because when we have to multiply an x by an x inverse, we always get a 1, and everything else we already know how to multiply. Um, so that's how we'll uh, come up with, a, with, with a, a formal description of these kinds of, of, of objects. And you might think, well, those are just the rational functions, but actually uh, they're not really because 1 over x plus 1 is in um, the rational functions, but not in this s of x, x inverse. So we can think of x and s of x and x inverse as really being contained inside the rational functions, but not being all of them. Another very formal way to create new rings out of old, so what we're really emphasizing here isn't so much the rings themselves, but the constructions of new rings from old rings. If R and S are both rings, then we can construct a new ring from the old ones by defining R with a plus sign with a circle around it, is the traditional name. And it's the set of all pairs, little r, little s, such that little r is in big R, little s is in big S. So it's the set of ordered pairs, something from R and something from S. Um, the addition and the multiplication are obvious in this, this, uh, this sort of vector approach. If I wanted to add or multiply or subtract um, this pair and this pair, I want to do this operation to them. What I do is, of course, just do that operation, add, multiply, or subtract this one, and uh, add or multiply or subtract that one, whichever operation we want to do. So that explains how to how to do the operations um, on these sort of pairs. And it's much like we did with vectors when, when we learned in your algebra, we learned to add vectors by adding their entries. But now we're not only allowing adding, we're also allowing multiplying, which we pointed out before was a bit strange from the perspective of linear algebra. 
and yet another elementary construction of new rings from old. If you have a ring S, then you can, um, and you have a, let's say, an N uh, positive integer, then you can look at what I'll call S N by N, and that's the set of all N by N matrices. with entries from this ring S. So integer matrices, for example, that sort of thing. So for instance, if I wanted to do this guy, Z2 by 2, that's the set of the set of 2 by 2 integer coefficient matrices. Matrices. Um, um, so they look like A, B, C, D, where those are all integers. Um, so that's, that, that's obviously going to be a ring. Um, where we use usual matrix um, addition and multiplication, and where the zero matrix is the is the obvious, we use the symbol zero to represent the zero matrix. That that provides us with well, pretty much all the constructions we're going to need to make new rings out of old lots of ways of constructing. So we start off with rings like the integers, the the reals, the rationals, the, the complex numbers, and and the remainders modulo uh, an integer m. And then we uh, we can construct out of this all these other rings. In fact, this this uh, sum of rings operation we actually did when we did the Chinese remainder theorem already. So um, so now we have lots and lots and lots of rings. If you apply these various operations, the ones we already had, we have enormously many, um, and they get to be extremely complicated. An obvious observation about about rings is that there are lots of ones sitting inside other ones. So as an example, the integers we've seen sit inside the rationals, which sit inside the reals, which sit inside the complex numbers. So there are sometimes rings sitting inside other rings. A subring R of a ring S is a subset. So R is contained in S so that um, addition and multiplication on R are just exactly just those from S applied to elements of R. So uh, going back to our examples, for instance, the integers sit inside the rational numbers. And when you add integers to integers, you get integers. You take rational number addition and apply it to integers, it gives you integer addition. If you take rational number multiplication and you apply that rule to multiply integers, then you get integer multiplication. Among all the rings we've now constructed, of which there are immensely many, certain ones are better than others. There are certain special types of rings that we prefer because they're somehow easier to work with and we can get closer and closer to being working with something more like the integers or the, or the real numbers that we're more familiar with. Um, a ring with identity, sometimes also called a ring with one, um, is a ring R with an element called 1, which we'll always write as 1, although, for, for instance, for matrices, it'll be the identity matrix, for example, um, so that um, uh, A times 1 is 1 times A is A for any, any A in the ring. So, again, as an example, if we took um, the real 4 by 4 matrices uh, and has, uh, has a 1, which is the identity matrix you're familiar with, with zeros everywhere except the 1's down the diagonal. Another property that's very special about certain rings, besides having identity on one, is that some rings have, um, have the nice property of being what are called division rings. The ring is a division ring if um, whenever we have a product A times B that's 0, then A is 0 or B is 0. One of the factors is 0. And we've seen that over and over again happening for various rings that we've worked with. So as an example, um, if you look at um, Z mod 3Z, it's a division ring. And you can check it easily enough because there's only it actually only has 0, 1, and 2 in it. So uh, we, we'd only have to check that 1 times 2 is 2 um, gives you uh, 
non-zero element. So the only way to multiply to get a zero would be to act, take one times zero or two times zero. Here's another example. If you look at z mod, say, 4z, it's not a, a division ring because in z mod 4z, 2 times 2 is 4, which is 0. Um, so two elements that are not 0, 2 is not 0, but 2 times 2 is 0. So that's uh, not a division ring. Um, another special thing that happens a lot and that we'll almost always want to have happen in our in our work is that a, a ring is said to be commutative if um, b times c is c times b for any uh, b and c in the ring. And that happens a lot, and we're going to really be uh, interested only in commutative rings pretty much from now on. But just as an, uh, some examples, um, well, we know that the integers are commutative. When you multiply in either direction, you get the same thing. The same is true of the rationals, the reals, the complex numbers, and the integers modulo any uh, modulo any m, the remainders, they, they also have this property of being commutative. Um, and that's obvious because they get they get their multiplication by doing usual multiplication of the integers and then taking remainder. I, I should perhaps point out that the commutativity property is only a property of the multiplication only. It's not a property of addition because we've assumed that every ring has has commutative addition. It's only the the question is only really whether or not the multiplication is commutative. Some important rings arise which which are not commutative, which don't have commutative multiplication. But there's no uh, no notion we'd want to ever deal with of a ring that has that has a non-commutative addition. All rings, by definition, have to have commutative addition. So the addition is always very straightforward. It's the multiplication that can be nasty. Let's look at an example which has a nasty multiplication. If we look at the two by two integer matrices, those are not commutative. That's a non-commutative ring. Why is it non-commutative? Let's let A be the matrix 0, 1, 0, 0, and B be the same matrix transposed. And then um, if we multiply out, we find A, B is um, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 is. If you multiply it out, I'll leave you to check that it's this guy. But then if you do B, A, that's the other way around. Here's the B, here's the A, and you can check that it gives you this guy instead. So these are not equal. And so you can see this is not commutative. And it doesn't get any better with if you put in rational numbers, real numbers, complex numbers, because the same example will work. And the same example will work in uh, integers mod uh, mod m, for instance. So you'll get uh, simple examples of, of non-commutative rings. Uh, matrices in general uh, form non-commutative rings, and that's sort of bad. Um, we won't be dealing with them much. So from here on in, it's pretty much only commutative rings that we'll ever really think about. Um, in any ring at all, um, we can all, we're always going to write 2 times something to mean that something plus that something and so on. It's convenient notation. We'll always only be interested in commutative rings, and also I should say we'll also only be interested in ones with identity. So from uh, now on, we only deal with pretty much with commutative, unless I, unless we state explicitly otherwise. It, all the rings that we're going to be dealing with are commutative rings with with identity. We've pointed out already that one of the bad things about the integers, and the reason why the rationals were introduced in the first place, is that um, uh, we have uh, Z contains an element 2, um, but uh, doesn't contain an element 1 half. It doesn't have uh, reciprocals. So we had to get to a larger place to have reciprocals. Um, so uh, um, a unit in a ring is an element that uh, in a commutative ring with with what let's say in a ring with one um, is an element b so that uh, b c equals c b equals one sorry equals one for some element c in other words it has a reciprocal and you can show as an exercise that there's only one such reciprocal, and so we'll always write it as 1 over b or b inverse or something like that. 
let's see what that looks like in, in practice. That's really why a long time ago now we decided we only wanted to work with integers mod a prime because when we mod it out by a prime like 7 we had 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 and we found that these guys were all uh, units uh, because they all, let's say, they all have reciprocals. The definition of a unit is something that has a reciprocal and 1 was its own reciprocal and then um, 6 was its own reciprocal and then um, we found that 2 and 4 were reciprocals and 3 and 5 were reciprocals. So we, we said we didn't like modding out by anything else because one of the terrible things about modding out by something else was that we uh, didn't always have reciprocals. If we look at integers mod 6 instead of 7, then we really run into trouble because 2 has no reciprocal and 3 has no reciprocal because 2 times 3 is actually 0 and it can't have a reciprocal, which you can check. So so that doesn't work. And also 4 doesn't have a reciprocal because it's two twos. So those don't have reciprocals. And then, of course, 1 is its own reciprocal and 5 is its own reciprocal. Um, so that's the sort of picture we run into. Sometimes we run into problems where there are no reciprocals, and that's bad. Um, so we don't we don't like that. We'd prefer to find reciprocals for things if, if, we, if we can. Um, if we look at the integers again, um, we could say that uh, that uh, inside the integers, uh, 1 and minus 1 have reciprocals. Minus 1 is its own reciprocal, and 1 is its own reciprocal. But nobody else does. No other integer has an integer reciprocal. So, uh, so none of the other integers are units. These are the units in the integers. This leads us naturally to some notation. Um, we tend to really write for a ring S. We write S cross for the set of all the units in S. It's uh, the collection of all, so we throw out the ones that don't have reciprocals. So in this case, we'd only keep the 1 and the 6. Um, so we can say Z as an example. Z mod 6Z units is the set of the 1 and the, sorry, 1 and the, one and the 5. Um, so we'd only keep the one and the five. Yeah, sorry, it's this one. I was thinking about it. Okay, so that's the that that's uh how we will we'll give a notation for the set of units. And uh and with that in mind we can ask well what are what are the units of some of these other rings? Um for example, if we look at rational polynomials in a variable x, rational polynomials in a variable x, and then we look for units. This this little cross is supposed to be tall is tinier than this x. You can see it in the notes better. X should be somewhat bigger than the cross. It's supposed to be a letter X, and that's supposed to be a tiny little cross. Um, so the units here are exactly the same as the units of the rational numbers because a non-constant polynomial doesn't have a polynomial reciprocal. Um, so it's just these, which is just exactly the non-zero rational numbers. They all have reciprocals. A non-zero rational number, a rational number, some B over C, and then C over B is its reciprocal. And so those those have um, all have reciprocals, all the non-zero rationals. And then this guy, uh, you run into trouble if you have a positive um, degree polynomial, then its reciprocal won't still be polynomial. But uh, you get a somewhat better picture. So this says that in some sense these have very few units, very few things that have reciprocals. But if you look at rational functions, look for their reciprocals. Every rational function is some ratio of polynomials, and if it's non-zero, you can always just flip it upside down. So you had some b of x over c of x. And you could take its reciprocal to be c of x over b of x, and that works fine as long as it's non-zero. And so it's just exactly the non-zero um, the non-zero rational functions. So we get to the idea that maybe we might prefer to work with uh with field with, with um, commutative rings uh with identity. So we like commutative is nice. Uh rings with an identity, rings with one. But wouldn't it be nice if they actually had lots of reciprocals? So a field um, is a commutative ring with one, with identity, in which all non-zero elements are units, they have reciprocals, so you can divide by everything but zero. And we already saw lots of examples of this. We saw the rational numbers units were the rational numbers except zero. 
and so that's a field according to this definition. And um, naturally that extends our, our description of the word field. Previously we said when we use the word field we always just meant um, the rationals or the reals. And every non-zero real number has a reciprocal, so it's a field. Or we allowed ourselves the uh, complex numbers, and non-zero complex numbers have reciprocals, so it's also a field. And then um, the other one we allowed was um, integers mod a prime. And uh, we discovered that that was in fact, all of those had reciprocals except for zero. So that's also a field. And so now we've, we can extend the word field to cover this more general definition here. And it happens to beautifully cover all of the examples we already were working with. We were calling these fields, using the word field before, to just mean just these, the, the rationals, the reals, the complexes, and the integers mod a prime. But now we can uh, use the definition of field here, this more abstract definition. And, and uh, all of the theorems we've proven about fields so far are still true. Every theorem we proved where we use the word field actually works with this definition instead of using the previous definition, which was just to use these objects. So we now have lots of lots more theorems with absolutely no more effort because the proofs work out exactly the same. Naturally, we're curious about building new fields out of old. A field is a special kind of commutative ring. Not all of our constructions will make new fields out of old, but an obvious one that does is that if uh, k, it's traditional to write little k for a field, um, even though it's a set. That's a bit strange. It, this doesn't mean like an integer number or something like that. This means this is always going to be a field. So these are examples of possible choices of k. If k is a field, so k is not like a number, it's more like a library than like a book. Um, and uh, if k is a field, uh, then um, the rational functions over k is also a field. Or you could put in rational functions in two variables and so on and so forth, any number of variables. So that's a new construction from an old one that builds up bigger and bigger, more complicated fields. And we'll put a lot of effort into thinking about how to construct new fields out of old. One particular observation here, though, is that also that k itself sits inside k of x. And it's not equal to k of x. So in other words, these are the constants. The constant rational functions are exactly the, the constants. So if you start with uh, a field, like for example, this little k is the rational numbers. The rational numbers sit inside the rational functions with rational number coefficients. And so you've constructed a bigger field. And then of course this goes into uh, having two variables and so on and so forth. So you can get bigger and bigger and bigger fields. Not only that, but even if this was say a finite field like this, these are examples, are, these are finite, they're finitely many elements inside this field z mod pz remainders mod p form a field with only finitely many elements. Even if that were finite, this is still infinite. This is always infinite. It always has x, x squared, x cubed, and so on. And although all of those are linearly dependent expressions, so, uh, so this is always infinite. And so we have the following obvious observation that every uh, field is uh, not just a subring, but it's actually a subfield. Which is that is a, a field being a sub a sub ring of another field is called a subfield. It's always a subfield of an infinite field. That's a useful fact because sometimes we want to add more numbers into a number system so that we can have uh, more more and more we can have infinitely many numbers to work with. We'll see that that's useful in studying polynomial equations to be able to have fields that are infinitely large. And uh, one way to deal with that is to extend the field to make it bigger by putting a variable in allowing rational functions, you get a bigger field which has, um, which has infinitely many elements. And that's a useful thing to be able to do um, for, for constructions about polynomial equations. Some fields are very different from others. Uh, among our fields, we can see that these ones are all somewhat similar, but this one's very, very different. After all, these all sit inside one another, but this is very different. So the, the, the remainders mod p, mod a prime, are very different, a very different kind of field. Um, the uh, characteristic of a ring, let's say S, is the smallest positive integer which becomes zero, uh, let's say on a ring, let's say with one. Uh, again, we're always thinking of commutative rings with one anyway, but it, it's fine for just a ring with one. Um, so we take the smallest positive integer, it becomes uh, zero in the field.
or in the ring. Um, what do we mean becomes? Becomes. Well, that means simply it's a ring with one. So if you have an integer, and you take the one, let's write it as one sub s of of the fee of the of the ring. So the ring is a ring with one. So there's a one. Let's call it one sub s just to to remember that it's the one of the of, of the ring s. Then m times one sub s simply means that you write one sub s plus one sub s plus dot 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 plus one sub s m times. And so if you have a positive integer, it makes sense to talk about doing it this many times, writing, adding it up to itself this many times. And that's the definition of m times uh, in any any element of any of any ring is that you add it to that itself that many times. So um, so that's the um, the the thing that has to be zero. It's the smallest positive integer, which so that when you add up this many times, you get zero, and that's the issue, whether or not that becomes zero. Uh, or we set um, uh, the characteristic is um, stick. It's traditional to say the characteristic is zero. We don't allow infinity here. Would you want? We want to prefer to write it as zero, if no such. Integer exists. Positive integer exists. So, um, so a characteristic is, po is is a positive integer. So that when you add one to itself that many times inside your ring, you get zero. If there's no such positive integer, we say the characteristic is zero. And uh, of course, our examples are really where this is coming from. Um, uh, Z mod P Z has characteristic equal to P because if you add p times 1, you get p, but when you're modding out by the p's, you get 0. So um, so that's clearly characteristic p. In fact, we could do it more generally if m, m, z has characteristic m um, for any m positive integer. You mod out by, uh, take remainders modding out by the, all the m's, uh, m fold copy of, of, the, of, of the, the 1 gives you 0. And um, similarly, um, uh, the characteristic of the uh, of the rational numbers is zero because if you keep adding ones, you get one plus one is two plus one is three plus da, 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 and keep going on and on and on forever, and you never get zero again. You never because they're always positive; they're just getting more and more positive. And the same for the characteristics of the rationals are zero, or of the reals, and also for the characteristic of the complex numbers is also zero. Sorry, the characteristic of the of the complex numbers, the real numbers, is also zero because again, if you keep adding ones, 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 you get more and more positive numbers inside the reals, and then the reals sit inside the the complex numbers. So if you could get one, to, a sum of ones to go to zero in the complexes, it already sit inside the reals. We've already encountered um, the notion of a division ring. Let's go further in that direction for a bit. Um, a zero divisor in a ring S is a non-zero uh, element of the ring, let's say B, so that um, BC equals zero for some uh, non-zero element uh, C. So it means we can multiply these two things together and get zero, so they're both called zero divisors. Um, so uh, the, these, of course, we've already come up with. We've already noticed these things. Um, we've already seen uh, that uh, in Z mod for Z, uh, two is a zero divisor. Why is it a zero divisor? Because two times two is four, which is zero up to fours. So in this ring, that's a zero divisor. On the other hand, if we look in a field, uh, there are no zero divisors. Why? Because if you have B not zero and C not zero, and you wondered what happens if BC, um, sorry, if you have B not zero and C not zero, and you want to know what happens with BC, well, um, B is not zero, so it has a reciprocal, so you can divide by it. Um, and then um, uh, so, well, you could say, let's say, if S is 0, then that would imply that you could multiply both sides by 1 over B. B, C is 0, that's like 3 to the B, and then C is 0. So uh, so you can see right away that in, in the field there's no, no way to have 0 divisors. So 0 divisors are sort of a bad behavior, and fields are immune to almost any form of bad behavior. 
as another example where we could get lots more um, zero divisors if you take R and S to be rings um, then we said we could make an R plus S let's suppose they're rings with one um, then we can make an R plus S uh, which was made out of pairs little r and little s little r from the big r little s from the big s so we have two different rings like for example the integers and the rationals and then we add formally integer plus rational uh, where we just write it as a pair an integer and a rational um, and then the, we said that the multiplication was uh, was very simply that you multiply the individual elements so you take one zero times zero one then by definition you multiply the first entries together to get the first entry which is zero the second entry to the second entry so it gets zero and so these are therefore zero divisors as long as I should say to be just to be really careful that the one should not be equal to zero some rings have one equal to zero and then that wouldn't work but um, but in this situation if the one of the ring happens not to equal to zero of the ring in both of the rings then these are both non-zero elements, and so that's a that's a zero element. So you get zero divisors. So zero divisors are fairly common. They come up a lot, and lots of different constructions of rings, but they don't come up in fields because almost nothing bad happens in any field. Now I want to say a little bit, but very little about a rather sophisticated example that's done in detail in the notes, um, which I don't want to do all, all of, just a little bit about. Um, so this is a rather difficult example of a field. We'll let k be the set of all uh, num real numbers of the form a plus b times a cube root of 2 plus c times the square of the cube root of 2 with a and b and c rational numbers. Now I'm going to claim this as a field, and it's a sophisticated example. We want to give an example that's not just a, not not one of the trivial little toy examples we've already been producing, but goes a little bit further to see that there's actually something else out there. Now, when you think about it, the reason that we're interested in these kind of things now, if if you add two expressions like that, you obviously get another one. Some rational adds to a rational to give a rational. A rational times cube root two adds to another rational times cube root two to give a rational times cube root two, and the same with this. So adding is obviously fine. You can add numbers of this form, rational plus some rational times this guy plus some rational times that guy, and you always get another one with the same form. You add two such, you always get another one. Multiplying is not so easy, but the point is that when the two to the one third hits the two to the two third or hits its if it hits itself, the two to the one third multiplies one two to the one third multiplies by another, you get a two to the two thirds. So two of these might makes one of those. But two of these, two to the one third times two to the two thirds, of course multiplies together to give two because you get through two to the three thirds, just two. And that becomes one of these. That becomes a rational. And so uh, so when that type of number hits that type of number, you get that type of number, and so on. So it's not too uh, hard to convince yourself that in fact these are these these are closed under multiplication. You can multiply any two numbers of this form and get another number of this same form. Um, so that means we're, we're 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 doing pretty well. We've got an addition and multiplication, and they and they um, they are defined on these objects. But in fact, these are real numbers. Right, this is containing the real numbers because every rational number is real. Every rational times this guy is a real number, so those are real, and that's a real number, so those those are real. So these are all real numbers, and so the addition and the multiplication are just ordinary rem uh, addition and multiplication of real numbers, and so they are automatically, for example, satisfying the associative law, the commutative law, the addition and the multiplication, and so on. So this is automatically guaranteed to be a, a commutative ring because it sits inside the reals, which is commutative. So it's a commutative ring with one, because one is one here, and then zero, b, zero, c, and set a to one, you get one. Um, so it's a commutative ring with one, and that's good enough uh, to get us most of the way. But it doesn't quite show that it's a field. Um, what we need to show is that uh, it's not, the, the, the problem is not, um, whether whether these things could somehow have trouble with uh, having reciprocals, it, they have reciprocals as real numbers. If this is a non-zero thing, then it has to have a non a, a zero uh, it has to have a reciprocal real number. But does that real number have to also have the same form? So what you wonder is if you take one of these guys of this form, and you take its reciprocal, um, its reciprocal, can it somehow be made equal to another guy of the same form? Let's say I don't know some. Uh, uh, let's use Greek letters alpha plus beta to the two-thirds plus gamma 
the to the uh, sorry to the two to the one third two thirds. So is it possible to write some for some alpha beta and gamma rational in the rationals? Is it possible somehow to do that? And there's a long, uh, uh, somewhat long proof in the notes, which you don't really need to read, um, that this actually works. Um, it uses a bit of, it's nice because it uses a little bit of linear algebra, but um, but we don't, it's not essential. Um, it turns out that this is actually the case, uh, proven in the notes then. So this is in fact actually a field. So this collection of numbers is a field. Um, these, these, the set of these numbers forms a subfield inside the real numbers that contains the rational numbers. So you can see there are fields in between the reals and the rationals. I, I'm going to say a few remarks about the possibility of doing linear algebra. Um, uh, with fields. The basic fact of the matter is that pretty much everything in linear algebra works uh, fine over fields, over any field. If you pick a field uh, and you try and do linear algebra with matrices, with entries in that field, or uh, all that sort of stuff that you learned in linear algebra, it all works very well. You can look at matrices with entries in the field and you'll find that they have Gaussian elimination, or Gauss-Jordan elimination, uh, whichever you prefer, uh, those are both; those are all fine. You can look at invertibility of uh, the notion of invertibility is the same, uh, the definition, and you can look at the problems about solvability, about solving linear systems of equations. Um, you can look at things like kernels and images and all that stuff. Um, uh, so ranks and kernels and images. You can look at things like determinants. You can calculate them using the same formula. Um, you can look at eigenvalues or eigenvectors. Um, all that stuff works with the same proofs. And all the all the theorems about these subjects, about these issues in linear algebra, they all work with exactly the same proofs. There are a few things in, in more sophisticated issues in linear algebra that don't quite turn out the same over different fields, but we won't really uh, pay much attention to them. We certainly won't need any of them. So, but we can take all this as given, all this sort of stuff, comes along for free. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can um, um, imagine that we'd started using not the real numbers but any field at the beginning of our linear algebra experience and we would be able to recover using exactly the same proofs as we used in the linear algebra class, all, all these results and all this information. But now where the coefficients are allowed to be from any field, not just from the, from, from the real numbers. But if it's a ring that's not a field, it's usually not true. Almost all, all the rings you can come up with that aren't fields, um, almost none of these results will work. Everything will go badly in every possible way. So fields are somehow very magical, very important, because they allow us to treat them, uh, treat them almost like the real or complex numbers and prove uh, an enormous collection of theorems with exactly the same proofs as we would have already used. So I want to give a, a serious application of this, this notion of fields um, because we've now seen we're able to construct them, but why would we want to construct them? Um, here's a nice example of a factoring in many variables. We're interested in trying to factor polynomials into irreducibles in many variables, not just in one. So we'll state a theorem that every non-zero of a polynomial, um, say p of x1 dot 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 xn, um, so in n variables um, over any field, um, over a field, uh, splits into a product of irreducibles. And that's not so surprising. That's almost by definition of irreducible. You break it down, down, down degree till it becomes irreducible. But it, the, the, the surprising bit is that it's unique uh, up to reordering and uh, perhaps multiplying by constants. So that's the result we already had um, for uh, polynomials in one variable. And now we're going to say that it's true in many variables, any number, any finite number of variables. And not just uh, over the real numbers, but over any field. So to start the proof, um, we make, again, the obvious observation that we proved this already. We proved it for what we were previously calling fields, but the same proof works for what we now call fields um, for one variable. So we're already done part of the way. And then the next thing, as I said already, is that the existence 
of a factorization is easy. Um, you just try to split the thing, and if it doesn't split, then it's irreducible. If it does split, you split it, and then um, keep going. So, uh, and of course, at each step, you get smaller and smaller degree polynomials. So, at some point, it has to stop. So that's easy. And now we have to worry about what do we do about uniqueness. So, um, what we'll imagine is that we might maybe we have two different factorizations that we have. A split this thing into irreducibles in this way. Um, oh, and by the way, I'll only use two variables. I'll only do a proof for two variables. Uh, and then um, it's the same proof for, uh, for more variables. So just to make it more concrete, I'll only use two. Um, so we split into a factorization this way. Uh, you split into your factorization, I split into mine. And now what we have to do is somehow check that... Um, what am I doing? M. Um, so I have to check that they turn out to be exactly the same up to putting them in a different order and then scaling them for each one by some non-zero constant. So it, it turns out that the proof is, is, is a lot easier as if I can arrange them to have some sort of simpler form what I want to do is I want to arrange that each of the polynomials um, looks like dot dot dot, dot plus uh, a constant non-zero constant times y. So I, this is what I want. I'm not saying I have this established. I'm saying this would be nice if only it looked like lower order terms in y plus a highest order term in y with just a constant with no x in it or y in it. So that would be nice. Um, and I don't know how to do that, though. How do I do it? What if that doesn't happen? Well, what I want to do is to change variables to make sure it does happen. Um, and that intuitively should work for pretty much a you know, randomly chosen change of variables, but it might not quite work. So, uh, so the idea of the proof is to, the next idea is to try um, changing the variables. Well, if that doesn't work, if it do happens not to have a constant here, what if I change it to x plus lambda y? and y. So I put in a constant where lambda is going to be a constant. What happens? Well then every term x to the, let's say, j y to the n minus j plus some, some constant in front of it. So the polynomial here that I'm dealing with is pi is something, 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 something. There's some constant here, something, something, something. Um, what happens when I plug in x plus lambda y in for x? Well, I still get this. I still get x, j, y, n minus j, plus um, I get various da 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 terms that emerge with various powers of lambda, various binomial coefficients expand out. But the very highest term is going to be plus lambda to the j, uh, y to the n. You can see that here. So that's going to contribute uh, a term. And, and if I can make that lambda be non-zero, I get a non-zero y to the n term. So every term here that appears in this polynomial. Every single term has some co coefficient in front, some other terms around it. Uh, every term, when you plug in this expression, pops out a non-zero a non uh, y to the n term, a highest degree term. So every highest degree term, if this was a highest degree term in the polynomial, if this one of the terms of the highest possible degree, it would generate a highest possible degree term with a non-zero coefficient, not equal to zero. As long as lambda is non-zero, that would work. So that looks good. Um, it looks like I'm getting what I want, this, uh, this nice form. The problem is, um, is that uh, you, get one, you get one of these uh, contributions, these are lambda to the, um, what was it, lambda to the j, y to the n, for every, uh, every term, they could add to zero. Uh, if I pick lambda badly, for a bad choice of lambda. Now, if I had infinitely many choices of lambda, I could always avoid the bad ones. Um, because after all, the lambda is the constant number. I get to pick it any way I want. And uh, and it pops out here in the for each of these terms. And then they, all, these, all those things add up to give me a y to the n term, a highest term in y. So that looks good. So what I've done is to, is to rearrange um, my polynomial so I get the highest order term in y to have a constant in front of it. That's good. The bad thing is, what if those all add, all add up to, to somehow to zero and they cancel each other out? Um, again, if I had infinite, an infinite 
uh, field, if I was working over an infinite field, I'd have no trouble because I could always pick a lambda for which that doesn't happen. Uh, all I have to do is find a way to get a lambda for which this doesn't, for which those cancellations don't occur. The cancellations will only occur for some polynomial lambda vanishing, so just to make sure that lambdas chose not to make that polynomial vanish. Now, the, the problem is I might have a finite field, so I might not have enough room in my field to pick the lambda to be to avoid solving all these things. So I need to be careful about making sure that I don't pick a bad lambda, but I don't have very many lambdas to pick from. It would be nice if I had more lambdas to pick from. And so that's what I'm going to do to try and use an infinite field instead of a finite field. Um, so in other words, we'll replace uh, our field that we're working over, uh, where our coefficients came from, by uh, extending by this guy. Now lambda is an abstract variable. And now if you have a polynomial expression in lambda, um, then you can't get cancellation because all the terms were different powers of lambda. All terms uh, that we added together had different powers of lambda. They were, each one was generated by some x uh, power times some y power. And so different uh, powers, we take the largest possible y power and then the highest x powers that show the highest total degree powers. Um, and so they'll add up to n, uh, some number n, and you'll get a different lambda to the j, different power of j for each one. Um, so you get, uh, so, so they can't, so that can't be zero. They can't cancel each other out. Different powers of a variable can't cancel each other. So for example, like lambda cubed plus lambda um, uh, is, is a non-zero polynomial because it has a non-zero lambda cubed term and a non-zero lambda term. They don't cancel each other out. They might cancel each other out if lambda was a number, but if it's an abstract variable, they can't cancel each other out. So we don't have any problem with cancellations. And now, um, when we pass to this larger field, we might worry, but in fact, uh, we're only trying to prove uniqueness of factorization. So uniqueness in a larger field already implies that it's uniqueness in a smaller one in any smaller one. Because if you have a two factors in the smaller field, you put the, that in, the, the, the smaller field sits in the larger one, you just put them in there in the larger field and you get two. So all we have to do is prove uniqueness in the larger field and we'll be done. So this means we can always assume, so we can always assume, assume that all the, um, the factors, pi of xy, have the form blah, 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 lower order terms, plus the highest order term in y. So let's say just highest, the highest order term of all occurs purely in y with uh, some non-zero constant out here at the front. And this is as high a term as it, as it ever appears anywhere else. And it's the highest term in y, strictly higher than all the others in y. And then, so they all look like this. So now let's just think of that as a polynomial in y. Um, as a polynomial in y with rational uh, function coefficients. Um, so rational functions of x. So the coefficients have rational in x. Or, well, in lambda, I suppose, too, if you want to put it in there as well. So you could think of them as being uh, rational functions of lambda and x at this point, um, because we do still have the lambda sitting around. Sorry, k of, um, so it should be should be k of x and lambda. Um, so uh, so we now have these kinds of, of coefficients, and um, and now um, we, we have uniqueness for one variable. Now these are one variable, one variable y, and then all the other variables are sort of absorbed into here, the, into its rational function coefficients. And that's fine, because the rational functions are a field, and so if you have coefficients coming from a field, you get uniqueness of factorization. So that means, therefore, that we must have uh, uniqueness. So this is, goes back to one variable uh, uniqueness implies, um, implies that each of the PIs, after maybe reordering, um, is some rational function. Let's just say of x. We won't have to worry about lambda because we can think of the lambda as being in the coefficient field. We've absorbed it into our field of coefficients. Anyway, it's a rational functions of x. That's where our coefficients are coming from. Uh, so uh, times um, this. Uh, the, you, this is your factorization and my factorization after some reordering. They agree up to 
up to scaling by a, by a constant, but the constants here are coming from the field, and the field is the field of functions in uh, the rational functions in x. And so this has to happen. Now I can just clear denominators, uh, put the ci of x, pi of xy is bi of xy, qi of xy, and then uh, now everybody's polynomials. But now we just look at the highest term in y. And you get uh, that ci of x times a constant, which is non-zero, equals bi of x times a constant, which is non-zero. And, um, and then, uh, th th then, then these have a common factor, and therefore we can, we can um, divide them by each other here. We can, after all, assume that these are, when you work with fractions, you can always assume that they're co-prime numerators and denominators. But if they're co-prime and they're also multiples of each other, constant multiples of each other, then they must be equal um, up to constant multiple. So they must be um, sorry, their their and their ratio must be must be must be a constant, right? So um, so bi of x over ci of x is a constant, non-zero, and um, and therefore uh, up to constants pi is qi up to this constant. There's the proof. So, so that's a rather long, difficult proof, but it does show us a useful fact that, that, that factorization is unique uh, for polynomials in any number of variables. We only did two, but the same proof works by uh, essentially induction from then on. Um, it also showed us, though, a powerful technique that we could introduce abstract variables, abstract symbols, into our field of coefficients, and this would enable us to um, avoid, in some sense, satisfying equations. We wanted to make sure that our various, uh, that, that our change of variables, x plus lambda y, avoided having any special uh, features for how lambda fit into the equations. And we can always do that by adding uh, abstract variables lambda. And this, this is a powerful technique to create a kind of, a kind of general conditions and avoiding special, special situations. In the next lecture, we'll talk about the algebra of, of um, formal infinite power series and, uh, and construct fields out of, uh, of Poisson series.